So I will get this recording started and the recording now has started. So my apologies for not recording to give people a brief intro since the recording just started. Do remote overview. I'm starting with a review of what imagery to source. Um, so my apologies for that, but let's get started kind of looking at some of those free options. So you might come to a site and you say, okay, I've got this house. I know what I want to design on top of. Maybe the quality isn't quite high enough, or maybe you just want to know when the image was taken. Frankly, it's something that's always useful to know, and it's going to be an integral part of our further design. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch over to Google Earth Pro. So this is an easy, free option to get high quality imagery of a site. And one of the most important things is you can also control when you're pulling the imagery from. From something like Google Maps, they're probably just gonna give you one date, or you know, you're working with Bing or something else like that. You're gonna get a single date there. Oh, and it sounds like my audio might be a little bit choppy. Um, um, is it getting a little bit better now? And if not, I'll just try to slow down so things aren't too choppy. Okay. Um, sounds like things are maybe a little bit better. So I'll make sure to keep to stay slow in case audio stays choppy. But so we've got this Google Earth imagery. This is free, and it's also we can control the date what imagery work and know what the date is. So you can see here, if I come up here to this top left area, I can actually go through and I can select different dates. So you can see some of these dates, the imagery is not good. Even the most recent imagery of this site, it's blue. It's not real, but we can go through and we can actually look for what seems to be a good shot. Now, there are a couple things that define a really good image. First, we always want to make sure it's high quality, but especially when you're doing remote design, I'd say you want to get an image that is before or afternoon, something where you have pretty distinct shadows on the ground. In fact, the earlier or late you can get that, the better it is. And the reason for that is because we're going to be estimating the height of this building based off of the shadows on the ground. We're going to be estimating the height of the based off of the shadows on the ground. Because we have those shadows, we can go through and we can identify exactly how high all of these obstructions are. We can identify the tilt of our rooftop. We can do all of this without ever to, and we're doing all this with imagery as well. So this is a really good way to pull that imagery. And then you can take a screenshot, you can upload that to your design program and you can start to work with it. So let's switch back over to, to Helioscope. And I know that uh, somebody raised their hand. Please feel free to put your question in the chat. I'll try to answer it as we go along. So let's switch back over to Helioscope. And in this case, I'm designing on a pretty high quality residential rooftop. It looks like I'm using this image here, or not this image, but this image um, from 2018. Decently high quality, but maybe I want something that's better. Maybe I will have a drone image that I want to upload. For any of those, I can come, I can go to advanced overlays and upload an overlay. And in this case, I've uploaded this overlay from near map. If I come up, apologies, just, uh, the pop-up makes it a little bit hard to, um, to select this. <laughs> there we go. Um, I switch over and I say, okay, I'm going to pull this image. You can see that date of the image down here. And this is actually something that's pretty nice for me to mark as well. So if I come here, you can see I've titled my design. I'm doing the full roof, but I've also got the date that this image was taken. Now that we've got this date, we can go through and the first thing we want to do, and this is going to be moving into the shade based height estimation side of things. First thing we want to do is make sure that we are actually considering how high everything else. Now to start, um, 
you know what, I realized that I didn't really go oversizing the overlay. So I will do that really briefly. When you upload an overlay, you're gonna have the ability to move this around, to edit the opacity, to do all these things. You can match up certain things on the ground, make sure that this actually does match. So you can see this Google image was taken at a little bit of an angle. So the near map image does have a slight shift in what's going on, but I'm marking, uh, on the ground to try to match it. So I've got something like a tennis court or these various buildings or a tree, a pool, anything that has an easy distinct line. One of the really good ways that you can match some known dimension. Like let's say you know that this tennis court is X feet long. You can draw out that line just as a straight line and then you can match up the overlay to it. Um, and it sounds like things are still a little choppy. Um, so I'm gonna try to get a little bit closer to my internet router. My apologies for this. I think this is a of the, the wonderful restrictions of COVID uh, coming in and everyone needing to be on the internet all at once. Um, so I'm getting as close to that router as I can right now. Uh, let me know if that works. And if not, I can try to, uh, I'll, I'll get even closer. I just have to, uh, to move some stuff around in my apartment. All right. So we can draw out that known dimension and match it up. You know, if I know this tennis court, this line is 80 feet long. Actually, this is a real clear line and it's known dimension that the tennis court will be a certain length, then I can put that in, I can draw it, I can match it up and make sure that this is the right size. So the next thing that we want to do when we based height estimation is we want to take something that has a relatively known height. So something like a light post or a tree or even a tennis net could certainly work well. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw out a little line for this tennis net here. And the most important thing here that I'm gonna do, and it looks like, oh, that is at a slight angle there. So maybe I don't wanna use the tennis net. Maybe I wanna come over, I want to say, let's draw the top of this tree here. So I'm just gonna draw a very small keep out that's just gonna effectively be a pole. And I'll set the height to something high like let's say 30 feet for me to see, or maybe I'll even do 60 feet. You can see this casts a pretty wide range of shadow on the ground here. And the thing is, what we're trying to do is we're trying to match up this shade to a specific time when this image was taken. So if we remember, in, on June 18th, 13th, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to where it says keep out from shade. I'm going to click this blue text. That's going to open up the keep out from shade where I can set this date. So this was taken June 18th, 2019. So I'm going to come back to June, set it to June 18th, 2019. And I can also take a look at what's going on here. I can say, okay, this looks like it was taken sometime in the morning. The, the shade is over to the west side. So I'm gonna start switching this time. Maybe I'll just start at 10 a.m. I'll set it and I'll set a single time window for when this is. And it looks like maybe this is a little bit early. You know, this isn't quite right. So maybe I'll say, okay, 10 isn't quite right. Maybe 10.15 or 10.30. 10.30 is a little too aggressive. And I can iterate through this, try to find something that's just about right. And in fact, it looks like 10.15 is just about right on the money. Maybe it's a little bit later than that. Maybe I'll say it's like 10, 18 or so. And so really quickly, you can see now I've actually got the edge of this shade lined up more or less to the shade that you can see here. Maybe that's a little bit more. So maybe I'll try 10, 20 instead. You line up to these exists on the ground. And now when that's lined up, I can say, okay, I know that this is actually taken at 1020 on June 18th, 2019. And so now I've got my date and my time. And this is where I can start lining up the heights of things. So 
I don't really need it. I've now defined time. I can remove that tree for now. But I can start defining my field segments. So I can start drawing out my rooftop and I can start defining my obstruction. With a single point, I can say, well, it's got about this diameter. Let's see how high that is. It says this is about 32 feet. Now, instead, I can say maybe it's nine feet. And now I can see this matches up pretty much exactly with the dimensions you see down here. And so that's how I can get those exact heights. I can get the exact height of the roof. I can get the exact tilt of the rooftop as well. And so for designing the tilt, one of the things we might want to do is I can come over here and I can start drawing out this roof. And the roof tilt, well, there are a couple ways to do this. First, what's important to note is that they're the common range of roof tilts. When we haven't visited the site, roof tilts tend to be between 4 over 12 pitch and 9 over 12. And that pitch is distance that it covers. So for every four inches up, you have 12 inches of distance covered. And that's typically between about 18, four degrees and 6.8 degrees. So I can come in here and I have a residential profile already selected, so I don't have to do anything too crazy, but I can come in, double click to finish my shape. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to now the top edge of my building. And because I've got a shadow on the ground here, I can start modeling exactly how high. So I can say maybe this rooftop is about 12 feet high or so. And you can see that doesn't quite match up with the shade here. So it's a little bit 14 feet, just about exact, exactly correct. And so I can line up this first edge, and then I can make these appropriate modifications. I can say, oh, okay, well, it looks like actually this roof edge here a little bit further in. Maybe this is a little bit further in as well. And maybe this bulges out here. So really quick, like actually the shape of this roof and the exact height. And once I have this one designed, I can actually, and actually one of the other things I should probably do is go back here, deselect it. And now it looks like the tilt is not quite correct, right? I can look at this line, I can see it doesn't quite match up with the angle of this. So let's start changing the tilt. 18.4, okay, that's not quite correct. Maybe two degrees or so, maybe. And we can just start doing these really obscene tilts <laughs> and matching up what is on the ground here. And maybe this isn't the best place to look at it. You know, Maybe I want to go somewhere else to figure out that tilt. But for now, I can say, well, even if it's a little hard for me to see Maybe I'm gonna select something like 18.4. So let's say we find ourselves in this situation. I'm not quite sure what I want the tilt of this rooftop to be. Well, get around this. And this is really important. Oh, and it looks like my internet connection is un a little unstable again. Let me know if, uh, if continuing to go. But there are a few ways to budget around what's going on here. And so let's, uh, let's draw a new field segment as an example here. So I'm going to draw out this completely new field segment. I'm going to draw that first line here and finish this shape. Oops. So now I've got these two roof edges here. And look at this thing here, 9.7 feet. So I've got this tilt of 18.4 degrees. Let's say I have a much higher tilt, or even a tilt that's a few degrees off. Let's say I have something like a 20. You see that goes up to 9.9. .9. So when I have an 18 degree tilt, it's 9.7. When I have a 22 degree tilt, it's 9.9 .9 feet. This means that we might want to build in some buffers. We are actually laying out our modules on the rooftop. If I've got a low tilt rooftop like this, there isn't necessarily a lot of space for me to screw up to be unsure. 
some modules like over here if I'm just fitting this module in the space. Maybe that's not quite right. Maybe I want to take a little bit of a setback to about, let's say, four degrees or so, and I see that goes from 9.6 to 9.9. .9. Maybe I give myself a setback around the edges of the field segment. I say, okay, you know what? I've three feet of different, I'll just 0.15 foot setback. It's not that much. But what's important here is that then gives me this buffer. I can say, okay, you know what? 0.15 feet. You know, it's, a, it's just about an inch on all these sides of the rooftop. That's the buffer I need to make sure that I can fit these modules into this space on the rooftop. Now, maybe I want it to be something larger. You know, if I've got a really high tilted rooftop, let's say it's 30 degrees. You can see now this is 10.6. So if it's maybe between 30 and 35, Oops, that's a 10, 10 to 11.2 foot difference. That's a lot of space that's going to change. So maybe I have to increase my buffer if I'm going to have that's just that high. Let me make sure that I've actually got the same tilt here. No. <laughs> so I do want to set that to 18.4 degrees again. We did have a question come in, um, somebody asking about moving the panels around. So yeah. Now that we've got laid out, um, and actually I'm gonna give myself a little bit more uh, leeway here, give myself a 0.3, or maybe I'll do a half foot set. Six inches on all sides, just as extra buffer for doing remote design. So how do I move these modules around? Well, first I'm gonna right click here. I'm gonna align grid of rules. So I can come here, align these modules to click. I can start moving them around where I want them on the rooftop and try to find that space. And then I can center these to try to fit as many into the area as possible. And when I add additional things, that means when I add them, I'm not going to over confuse what's happening on my rooftop. Now, that said, <clears throat> for the person who is asking, move these around manually. There are some cases where maybe you do want to put these in manually. You say, hey, you know what? I think instead I'll put in a landscape module here. Well, in that case, we do have manual module controls. So I can select this. I can add in these modules. I can hold shift to snap to an existing grid. So, you know, if I say, hey, I want to add that in individually or, <coughs> excuse me, I want to add in, in a group, I can actually these out, tile these out, see what's going to work. If I don't like it, I can always click this to undo. So that lets you lay stuff out a little bit more specifically. But once I've actually designed all these things for a particular side of the roof, I realize that this one, I probably need to go back through, maybe center my modules. I try to align where they are laid out on the roof to fit as many in there as I can. Now that I've done that, all those other That same tilt, same height, that same setback, all those values. So I can really quickly start designing out where I actually want to put these modules on the rooftop. But now that I've set that one spot, the height correct, I've got the tilt correct, all of these things, I know which modules I want to select. Now it's really more about actually drawing out those shapes. And the thing is, take your time to do this. It's okay to mess up. You know, if I if I draw this somewhere I don't like, okay, I can hit a I can delete it, I can redo. When we're doing remote design, you've, you've kind of got a limited chance to talk to the customer or impress them. Looks sloppy, where you've, oh, and my internet connection's a little bit unstable again, so let me know if there are issues. If it looks sloppy, if it looks like I'm the right thing, oh, I've, I've kind of just blown that first impression. So I wanna make sure that whatever I'm doing, I'm taking the time to say, okay, let's actually draw this roof out carefully. Make sure points are all where they're supposed to be, set the alignment of my rooftop. And when I'm doing that, when I'm taking my time here, when I'm drawing out these field segments correctly, it means that I can actually, you know, this. I can come through and I can have this really detailed view of their house. You know, they're, they're going to come and say, wow, you actually took all the time to draw this out. And even if I'm doing this relatively quickly for me, 
seeing this. This is easy for me to do. Um, maybe align these modules uh, to be a little bit lower here to avoid the ridge line. You know, I can go through, I can draw all this. Add last roof segment here. If I say this is the only part of the roof that I want to install on, it's kind of this, this section, this area. Oops. So that's the top edge. Now look at this. I've got this gorgeous rooftop to match up here. Now there are a few things when we're doing this. First, you notice that I'm a little bit higher than these other sections of the roof because this height is based off of, you know, the height that I'm getting here is because this rooftop is a little bit wider than these other sections. So maybe I want to make that a little bit lower. I say, okay, this is 13.5 feet or so. Then I can match up those ridge lines exactly. So you can actually put all those modules where I want them to be on the roof. And that's even less, maybe 13.3, oops, 13.3, boom. Now I say, all right, I've got a pretty well-designed roof. Probably want to consider is I probably want to consider some of the shading elements that are around my rooftop here. So I do have this tree drawn out. I said, okay, I'll use that. Let's delete it for now. I don't really care about that tree's shading on this part of the roof. And let's start designing the obstructions that actually matter for this rooftop. So, matching this diameter. So if I'm using the tree tool, I can just come out here, I can match that diameter. I can make sure it's about the right height. You can see here, this is actually a little bit too high. Maybe I say that's actually more like a 35 foot tree, maybe even lower. Okay, so instead of 35, maybe it's more like 25 or so. so about 25 feet, I can grab this and I can click and make it maybe a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger. You know, I can I can edit that and pull this up to actually give it the correct height, the correct diameter as well. So I can say, okay, maybe that this so that you know we do have this relatively large tree the stuff below the edge of the rooftop there isn't going to matter it's just the stuff that's above we want to make sure that that's correct so we've got a few other trees here as well we can model those out in the same way you may be thinking well i can't really see the shade on the rooftop here so what does it matter that i'm actually drawing these out and this actually will matter quite a bit you know, if I don't consider these trees, if I say, oh, it'll be fine. These, these trees are all about the right height. It, it doesn't matter too much to me. Um, I might be sending myself to a situation where I am not estimating the shade correctly for this site. And that's not gonna be good. You know, I don't, I don't want to estimate something that I can't produce for my customer. I wanna really make sure that I'm taking a look at it. Also might be thinking is why am I drawing these trees over here? that are a little bit north or maybe that are just to the side of the rooftop that are a little bit far away? Well, there are a few reasons for that. One of the big things is that shade doesn't just come from something being. Also comes from the fact that you've got a building nearby and that blocks out part of the sky. A lot of the light that modules see comes from reflected things. air and other objects and coming in the modules. In fact, it accounts for about a third of the light that modules see. So if I've got something that's getting in the way of that reflection, even if it's not shade on the modules right then, it is coming off a part of the sky. So going through and just designing the things that are actually going to have an impact on this rooftop that are kind of in that line of sight, that's probably something that's gonna be pretty useful. To me. Now, the other thing that I can do is I'm gonna come in here and I should probably define some of the Now, per used to do a lot of design to California fire code. This has changed with kind of the reduction in those. So the important thing now is to consider what restrictions are going to be. Maybe it's going to be the number of panels that you actually want to install on a rooftop. You say, okay, I've got this budget. You've just got 20 panels. You say, okay, this is where I want to put them. All right, that's your limiting factor. 
So I can say, well, these north facing, these east west facing segments, they're not going to be so important to me. I can remove the modules from those areas. I can put in a keep out and it's, um, to take them out. Maybe I can just delete them, anything like that, remove the things that don't work. Or maybe I have other restrictions. Maybe I say, okay, well, if Cal but I still have some of those build setbacks. I say, oh, well, it turns out that I do need to add in a ridgeline setback here, about three feet. It's okay to go through and have some of these overlap. Set this to three feet and make sure modules aren't placed there. Do that for these ridgelines and make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Oops, and it looks like that one there didn't quite cross over. So I'll do that, make sure that that hits both of them and draw another one right here. So this does reduce available Maybe that informs some of the decisions we make. Maybe we say, okay, we'll put these in the landscape. Maybe we'll put some in portrait. Maybe we'll move the modules around a little. Go through and define these restrictions first. You're getting really into it. You're putting all the modules exactly where you want to, but you haven't considered the effect from a tree, or you haven't considered the setbacks that you might need, well, that, that might get you into a little bit of trouble because all of a sudden, now no longer can place modules where you thought you were going to. You've put in a lot of work, and it turns out you were just gonna change that anyways. So don't necessarily worry about the layout of these modules to start. Figure out the roof tilt, the module you wanna use, that you have as a default, but then lay out those obstructions, lay out those restrictions, and then come back through and make those additional changes to the rooftop to say, okay, I want these modules over here, that's fine. Maybe I say, okay, now this is where I'm gonna add in this chimney that I've got over here. It's relatively tall, I can add that in. I say, okay, it's, maybe it doesn't have a huge setback, maybe just a foot and a half. So I also know that height's got to be a little bit bigger since I've got it off the edge of the roof. And you can see there that, that is, that's matching up the shade on the bottom there. Oh, and maybe it's a little bit higher. Maybe I say, okay, that's more like 20, uh, 20, not 120, 20, 25. There we go. 25. There we go. And so I match up the shade on the ground there. And now I actually have how high this object here is going to be. Great. So that lets me set those restrictions. Now, the next thing that I'm probably gonna to wanna to consider are my shade restrictions. And actually, we did have a couple come through. Um, somebody asked, uh, somebody said the connection's not good. Have, have I done this webinar a few times? Um, I unfortunately, so this is something that I'm putting together as a response to the coronavirus pandemic thinking, let, how can we actually help people do remote design? Um, so if it's high quality, uh, I'm more than happy to run it again or record it by myself um, in a room and make sure that you have higher quality audio. So my apologies again for being a little bit unstable. Um, somebody else asked, once you set the height for a new segment, does the system automatically set the same height for the other ones that you added? Yes. So it automatically sets all of the other things that you have. So whether you've set your setback or the modules you're using, the height of the field segment, all of that, that all are actually, like once you did one, all of that's going to be copied over to the others, which is why I didn't have to set the height for all of the rest of these. So. Next thing I probably want to consider, and actually I'm going to come through here. Maybe I say this isn't quite tall enough. Maybe I'll say this is more like a 70 foot tree. No, this is like a 90 foot tree. It's pretty tall. I'm just going to match up the shade for all these things on the ground that I think are going to matter a little bit more. So this is a 50 foot, 45 foot tree. Just want to match up all of those. Add another tree here because we've got this uh, this incredible cluster of trees, um, and maybe say this is going to be about sixty feet high, eighty feet high. So, yeah, I can come through. I can start matching this up to exactly what's happening on the ground here. So I've got this relatively, you know, it's, it looks a little bit funny, but that's going to get us some pretty high quality shade estimates. So one thing that's worth noting 
is this process that I've talked through here, this shade-based height estimation. This process is high quality enough to call the estimate for shading analysis as LIDAR, or better, actually, in most cases. We did a study with NREL. They took a look and overrides. They said, all right, this process lets you get the same quality uh, estimate for, for height, for shading, as 3D data. So that means that you no longer have to go visit a site if you don't want to. This really helps for if you're doing something that's going to be remote. You don't have to come through and say, oh, I have to get up on your rooftop or make the customer get up on their rooftop or anything like that. You can do all of this remotely. All of this in what the results are going to be. So, and I, um, I'm getting the unstable warning again, so let me know if I have to repeat anything. But the next thing I might want to do is I might want to go here to advanced shade analysis. So one of the elements here is a lot of people used to remove modules if they were shaded on the winter solstice. They'd say, okay, if modules are shaded during this time window on the winter solstice, I don't want to place them on the rooftop. In fact, that was the original use to keep out from the shade checkbox here. But the thing is, that's not really a great way to evaluate shade. We're only really talking about the shade loss for a single day of the year. Instead, we want to make sure that we're doing our shading analysis in a much more fine-tuned level. So I can come through here. I'm going to go to advanced shading over here on the left. I'm going to click calculate shade. And this is going to calculate the shade losses for all those modules on the array for every hour of the year. Now, this is important because this lets you get a much clearer definition of how all these modules are performing. And it turns out actually it's not necessarily a bad design. It turns out I've got some shade losses, about 5%, but that might just be because I have this number of tall trees over to the side here. I say, okay, oof, these, these are pretty tall. They're going to cause a lot of shading on my rooftop. Also tells us I've got this module cutoff of 14%. It means that my worst performing modules are losing 14% of their energy due to shading effects. So I can start changing this. I can say maybe that's too high of a cutoff for me. If I bring this down even to 10%, we see that this rooftop has more or less been limited. If I don't want any modules that lose more than 10% of their energy due to shade to be placed on my rooftop, turns out maybe I shouldn't be placing modules on that side. So I can manually remove those, or I can start moving this even to my shade losses. And one thing that's actually pretty valuable to look at here is when these shade losses are affecting our design. So I'm going to click this Show Monthly Values button here. And you can see if I take this all the way back up, we're actually performing pretty darn well in the summer months. Between March and September, we've got a few losses due to shade, but they are not bad. We have some losses in the winter where we get below 90%. We still probably want to cut some of those modules. But this is actually something that's important to look at as well, because if the production really only matters in the summer, well, it turns out it's not really affected in the summer. 7%. Say, okay, 7%. Now you can see I'm getting up to 98% here. I've brought this up in the winter months as well. So this is a really good way to just go through, evaluate, be specific about what you want to tolerate for those shade losses, because you're always going to have some shade losses. But this lets you see where those shade losses are. And we did have a couple more questions come through. Um, somebody saying, uh, can you show again by the flat roofs? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to that, um, uh, what you're referring to by that. Please feel free to, to type that in again, elaborate a little bit more, and I'm more than happy to go back over things. So I've removed all these modules due to the shading effects. You can see I've got 3.6% shade losses. I've removed, I've taken that module shading cutoff down over every month. Great. So I've got a really detailed idea of how this is going to perform. I can say remove those shaded modules, and then I'll go back and I can remove those excess modules that don't quite fit in my design. Now, I come here to the electrical system, and especially for residential segments, 
a really important thing that I might want to do here is I might want to make these distinct. Now, for a site like this, microinverters are always a good option. It's probably something that you might already be using automatically. But what I want to do is I want to say, well, I've got this north facing and this northwest facing. Now, maybe it makes sense for this customer to put these here. But I don't necessarily want to hook this up to my south facing root segment. So instead, I'm going to create another wiring zone. I'm going to click back here, click new. And I'm going to move the appropriate field segments to the other wiring zone. So these others here, they don't have any modules in them, so I don't really have to worry about them. But now you can see I've got these distinct shapes. So this south facing group of modules and this north facing group. This is also really important to do if you have string inverters. You don't necessarily want to mix those different orientations within the same string inverter, particularly if they're small. Um, so you just go different wiring zones, and you avoid some of the mismatch losses that might come as a result. Looks like we had a couple questions come in. Um, one of the, uh, yes, so somebody saying, one of the challenges that I have is getting accurate production estimates is there are so many variables, and I lose confidence in the numbers. I want to give information as best as possible, but when I compare to, let's say, PV watts, the production is sometimes really different. So, um, one of the big things there, so I'm going to save an exit here. Um, so save an exit to get out of the design. And we're thinking, all right, we're a little bit unsure of our production. The thing is that you're always going to be a little bit uncertain about your production with solar. But what you want to do is you want to come up with a scenario you are as of that production as you can be. Now, there are a few ways to talk about this. First, let's say you're comparing to something else. You want to make sure that you are comparing with kind of as apples to apples as you can. So if I come to the condition set here, this is where we're using, we're compiling all of our environmental effects that are going to affect our array for a simulation. But you see, this says I'm using this TMY prospector data. Now, if you're using PV watts, you're probably going to be using TMY ground data. So instead of this prospector data that's been automatically grabbed, I'm going to want to come in here, new conditions. I'm going to create another condition set. There we go. And I can select different weather files. So if I were designing in this site, I can actually zoom in here. I can see where these weather files are being pulled from. I'm pulling this TMY3 file if I'm using PV watts. So I can select that. Maybe I'll call this my TMY3 file. And now I can actually use that weather file instead. I can match that up to something like PV watts. Now, another thing important to consider here is weather is variable. You know, if you do a simulation, you install it, and then you try to look month to month or day to day or hour to hour and say, why isn't my production exactly the same as what I simulated? And a big part of that is weather is variable. It's always going to change. Weather can fluctuate a pretty big amount year to year, it can fluctuate something like 20%. And that's from a, a core average. So you might have something that you have a great year, you have so much production, you're absolutely blowing it out of the water. The next year, and actually something that's interesting, um, I believe, uh, Green Tech Media took a look into this recently. Um, the past few years, or no, it's uh, Solar GIS. Solar GIS, I think, took a look into this recently. Um, the past few years, we've actually seen a lot less irradiance than you might expect in a lot of the US, over the entire world, really. And solar sites have been underperforming. So how do you avoid something like that? Well, one of the ways that you can do that is you take a cut to what your production is. So there is something called a P90 estimate that banks will use. They'll say, hey, we'd love to finance your project, but we want to be confident it's going to produce this much energy. Now, the really conservative estimates there cut about 4% off of the production. And this can vary from place to place you have available data. So for a TMY3 or TMY2 file, you can actually come in here and let's say for the TMY2, I can select that and you can see I've got years from 1961 through 1990. I can simulate 
contemplate each one of those individual years and actually take a sampling of that and from it get an estimate of what I'm confident it's going to produce. So I've got 30 individual years there. I can take those individual years, I can simulate them, I can plug them in, and then I can get this probability estimate. I'm going to say with 90% certainty that the, that the system is going to simulate this much energy in a year. That's something that's really useful, especially if you're doing any sort of a commercial deal or you're uncertain about what production is. And for that, I recommend, I would recommend taking a look both at our help article and I know that, um, oops. Sorry, I'll just put that, uh, here we go, I'll put that uh, in the link here. We've got an explanation here. We've also got a link to a heat spring introduction on P50 and P90, but this gives you a lot of information about what this is, how you can do it, how you can create this information. Um, and there are, uh, there are sites that actually give you this quality information. So for instance, Solaris does allow for purchase of P90 quality files. So you can come in, you can say, hey, with 90% confidence, I'm probably gonna produce this much energy. And let's take a look at any other questions that have come through. Um, so something else that someone asked, uh, somebody said, how do you compensate for larger angles of satellite photos that happen the further north you go? So let's say you're designing in Edmonton in Canada. So this is actually something that I, um, I've talked about a fair amount. I've conferenced in Canada the past couple of years. Um, and it was in Calgary and satellite images often came up as something that wasn't quite right. You know, you get a high tilt on your satellite image. So there are a few ways to deal with that. Um, the first off is first, if I'm coming in and I have something like the Google Earth imagery, you can see even though this is, you know, in California by Google, you know, this is a few miles away from Google's campus and this is the quality of imagery they took. Oof, that's not particularly good. But coming through and searching through past imagery, maybe it's a little bit out of date, but if this is relatively accurate to your rooftop, use some of that older imagery. Look for that older imagery in free sources that you can get. Just because it appears in Google Maps, that's the only image. Come to something like Google Earth, look through historic imagery, uh, other things like Digital Globe, or third-party providers, near map, um, you know, drone deploy, pictometry, places are going to be trying to take photos of where you are actually located. And so they're going to have some historic imagery of the site. Now, let's say they don't have that. That's okay. This is where something like a drone is really going to be useful. Because instead of you having and having to guess, you say, oh, I've got a lot of tilt on this site. I think it's going to be about this large. The thing is that tilt can, can hide a number of other things. It can hide things that are on the roof, maybe vents. You thought, oh, I missed that vent. Now I'm gonna have to remove some of these modules. Instead, take the time, go out, fly that drone, take an image, and you can use that to design. Say you can get that, it's not worth getting, but you can get the, the building plan for what you're designing. Use that building plan, take it, upload it. It's got all the things drawn out. And so you can go in and you can get estimation. If that still works for something that's nearby, great. Go in, get the height if you're not getting that from the building plan and just build it up from there. And so it's like, you don't necessarily need to depend on that satellite imagery. Getting that imagery from another location um, is perfectly fine. Get it design with it, make sure it's scaled appropriately, but that'll let you do what you're looking for. And just checking, and I think that was the last open question. I'm gonna keep on moving here, because the next thing, oh, and my internet connection's a little bit unstable again, but the next thing that I wanna talk about is then this comes to various exports. First, I'm gonna simulate reports here, but, we have a few exports that you can use to take this to whatever that next step is. How do you get them? Well, if I come back to the designs tab here, I can, add, I can get a single line diagram, I can get the layout image. And the thing is, these are good places to start. They're not necessarily, 
they're not necessarily going to be immediately permit ready, but, or you've got a designer that you're working with, anything like that. This is where you can get that information and send it to people very quickly. So I can come in, I can say, hey, I've got this CAD file, I've got this single line diagram that I wanna to send to you and make further edits from there. Well, it's really easy to grab these and make those additional edits. So instead of you having to just have that initial design and not quite be sure where to go from there, you can at least send this off as something where you're starting. And we did have another, oh, okay. So I can come over here and I can say, look, you see, there is actually a pretty big difference between these weather files. So it is worth me coming through and simulating different weather files, kilowatt hour per kilowatt peak. You know, they've got about the same performance ratio. That's a pretty big difference. A whole megawatt hour over the year for a residential system like this, that's a pretty big difference. And so it's worth me taking the time to go through, to simulate different weather files, to be confident about what that estimate is going to be. And sure, it does take additional time, but it's perfectly, um, it's uh, perfectly uh, acceptable to take that extra time to do it. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can also send share links with Helioscope. And this is something that we maybe don't emphasize a ton, but especially if, let's say, you've gone out and you've, you've made some sort of sale or you're working remotely. You know, you've got your team or you've got a different company who you're working with and you're trying to send this back and forth, you're trying to work on it. Well, you can send them a share link here. So I come to sharing, share link. I can get this share link and to someone so that then they can access the design, they can take a look at it. So you don't just have to be limited to, I can only show this to you in person, or this has to be dependent on a certain location or a certain individual. You can send those share links around. You can make sure that people can actually um, take a look at what you've designed and they can do it quickly. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that we probably want to consider when we're doing designs like this is just how do we maintain that social distance but do something that is more personable because that's really what's still going to distinguish you from the competition. Being personable, making sure that you're still engaged with your customers. Now you may not be able to talk to them in person, you may not be able to do the things that you previously used to be able to do. Maybe you can't do your rooftop walk. Maybe you can't go and take dimensions. Maybe you can't really have a face-to-face -face conversation with people. So, I think Desmond probably talked about this in last week's webinar a little bit, but just going through, you know, think about what you would typically ask somebody for or what you'd go and you'd measure yourself and think about how you can kind of consolidate that and make it easy for someone to work with you. Say, hey, let's set up a video call, walk around your house, talk with me about what's going on. Like, what do you need? What's uh, what's on the roof there, let me, let me take a view so I can actually get a pretty good estimate of what the tilt's going to be. You know, any of that, set up that video call or say, hey, can you show me, can you send me an image of the AC panel so I know what's gonna be going in there? So you can make sure that you're actually sizing stuff correctly. Can you send me, uh, can you tell me what obstructions are on your rooftop? Or maybe they can even send you what the underlying structure of their roof is going to be. So then you know exactly figure out what flashing you're going to use when you're on site um, because, you know, all of a sudden you can't go and you can't talk to this person. And find ways to make things personal as well. You know, that drone photo is actually kind of personal to go and to take a site, an image of the house, say, hey, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to come in. I'm going to respect um, the, these virus restrictions, but I'm going to take this image making these edits today. Maybe I can even take this image, go send you a design in the same day. And it still feels like that human connection. You're still doing something with somebody. That's how you're still going to get those high quality sales. Connect with that customer. What can you ask them? What can you ask them for? How can you interact with them to make that process easy? You know, that's what that kind of have to stay um, six feet away from one another. But let's see if we had um, 
somebody said, is last week's webinar available somewhere for those of us that missed it? So I do believe we have the recording. Um, send us a message at support at FolsomLabs.com and send you that recording. And that was Desmond going over his tactics for remote sales, um, which is definitely something that's really valuable. So he um, did remote sales when he first moved out, out to the West Coast. He had been a... Um, a residential salesman in Florida, and he actually improved his sales numbers by developing these processes, these kind of, um, you know, I don't want to say temp because it is more human than that, but developing processes that were standard that, that kind of set everything up for the customer. So instead of just treating each one like it was completely new, walk through the door, have that conversation, he couldn't. He was remote. He had to be a little more um, you know, plan out. And similarly for this, when I'm working in this program, um, you know, doing my designs, I think setting up templates is also just a great way to make sure that you are doing stuff similarly, that you don't have to say, oh, well, you know what? I had that six inch setback around my field segment, but I didn't set it for this one. And now I've got modules somewhere I can't instead of having to make that thing that you have to consider every single time you do a design, every time you do something new, you can create project profiles. So if I come here, I go to my account, I'm gonna open this up. I can come over that preset a lot of things that I'm doing here. So similarly to those other values, you know, if I come in and I can say, hey, I've got this mechanical profile, I can come in and I can edit this. I can say, all right, I'm going to select specific I want to use all the time, or maybe I have a set that I've favorited. I want to select a specific racking orientation of my modules. Maybe I say I want these all to be centered automatically. I can set a specific tilt if I'm designing for a whole neighborhood, let's say, that all have the same tilt. I can set row spacing, setback, module spacing, frame spacing, all this sort of stuff. I just do that to start, and now I don't have to set it later on. That mechanic, we have the same for electrical, we have the same for our condition sets as well. So you come in, you set those templates, you know, take that time. We've all, we've all got some time now. Take that time to set up those templates so then anything you do from that point on is going to just automatically use those best practices that you set out from the start. Setting those templates, making sure that all that's set up, then it just means, hey, all you do, you take that image, you get when it was taken, you match up that image there and you don't have to worry too much more about the rest of the design. You draw out where you place those modules. So you apply whatever restrictions are appropriate for this, um, for this uh, rooftop, but you don't really have to do any more than that. You don't have to put in extra work. You don't have to spend extra time. Set up your template and then it just makes the rest of it so much easier to do. And especially when you're doing something remote, maybe you're gonna be doing a lot more designs. You're gonna be reaching out to more people. You're gonna be saying, hey, I've come in with this design. Are you interested in solar? Right off the bat, instead of having to have that initial conversation, then do a design. You know, Whatever you think that you're gonna be changing your sales tactics around to be, making them a little more standard or making the process a little more standard means that you're saving. Now, that's most of what I wanted to go over here. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, send those in here and I will answer them for as long as they're coming in. But first off, thank you all for being here. I also hope that this was helpful. You know, I wanted to make sure that we didn't go over too much stuff, but we went really, on, really in depth on how you can do these designs remotely. Um, this is something where we are going to set up a series of these webinars. So we're going to be covering more and more stuff. Um, things like, let's say you are a Spanish speaker, we're going to be doing a Spanish webinar. Or if let's say you are, um, you want to be talking about design optimization. That's something else we're going to be doing in the future as well. Going through saying, all right, we got our designs. How do we optimize them? How do we make these as I, you know, we want to make sure that we are designing stuff that is valuable for you in this time. It's all going to be free. It's all going to be as useful as we can make it. And if you have stuff that you want us to cover, please send us a message, send us feedback. We want to make sure that that is there, that that's available for you, and that we're offering 
and whatever expertise we can to make that process even easier for you. So hope that you're all doing well. I know that you know we're all going probably a little bit stir crazy. This is a few weeks inside for me, a few uh, a few weeks more than I might prefer normally. But you know we're all getting through this together. Solar is going to be it is going to be okay through all of this, um, and you are going to be strong. In, in making sure that your business moves forward. You're gonna be able to do this remotely. You're gonna be able to get efficient. You're gonna come out of the, a stronger business because of it. So thanks again for attending the webinar. Doesn't look like we have any questions, but if you do, send us to them at Folsom Labs, support at FolsomLabs.com, put a comment somewhere. We're gonna be more than happy to answer that. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your, rest of your week, great rest of your day. Stay safe out there.